Hey, and welcome back. This is Scott Taylor with Scott Taylor Private Coaching. We are hopefully, and we hoped last time that we were on our final session. This is session four for the 2021 December uh, Residential Purchase Agreement California update. And we are going through paragraph by paragraph, sometimes line by line, working out the details. Uh, this is a um, an open discussion. So we have a number of people who are here online that you might hear some voices that pop in with questions from time to time. I have Kate Graham, my mentor, and uh, our broker support backup, as well as a number of other agents that are part of uh, coaching and not of coaching. These calls on the first and third Tuesdays are free. Uh, it's a group coaching call. And it's provided or it's sort of sponsored by my coaching company, scotttaylorprivatecoaching.com. And uh, we have open discussions. Today, we're going over specific training, but most weeks we do some about 20 minutes of training. Uh, we have a segment that we call What's Your Deal, where agents get to talk about deals that they're working through and we try to solve problems. And then we have just general Q&A. Uh, it's a great thing if you have somebody that you know that's interested um, in participating live, encourage them to join us here. And just go ahead and forward the invite. Those who are on the call have today have a chance to pull the documents down, uh, the new contract and a training manual uh, from the chat. And oh, before we get going too, want to make sure we always do our um, disclaimer, right? So this, uh, what we talk about today is intended to be for your information and uh, education, not intended to be tax legal or other advice, including adv to supplant advice from your broker. If you have something that comes up that is needs to be referenced by your broker, we encourage you to take what you learn here and ask a good informed question and get your broker's take on it. We will often, Kate and I especially, are pretty good at that reference if you wanna to talk to your broker about a specific problem. Um, but disclaimer, don't take this as the gospel because I'm not a preacher. Okay, so we are, um, Going to pick up where we left off last time. You, you're done looking at me. We're going to look at the contract. So we are in the, this is the new contract, uh, paragraph 14. And if you remember, or you've just listened to segment three, session three that we did, um, we got kind of in the weeds on the notice to perform and the, the specific line in here for whether or not scheduled performance day falls on a Saturday, Sunday, or legal holiday. And uh, we had a little, little episode of Stump the Dummy while we had the camera rolling. <laughs> it, was kind of, it was kind of messy. Anyway, we've, we've cleaned that up. I actually got on the horn with uh, Car Legal, the California Association of Realtors legal team there uh, on the hotline and got the details. So as we mentioned last week, and, and Kate um, did a great job of explaining, the, the normal timeline for performance, the actual day of performance cannot fall, or if it falls on a weekend or a holiday, the actual performance, the, the demand to perform will actually get pushed till the end of midnight of the next business day. So for example, if you had a contingency that was supposed to be released on day 17, day 17 was a Saturday, regardless of the notice to perform or a demand to close even, um, if, it, if that date falls on a Saturday or Sunday or a holiday, then the actual demand is automatically going to get pushed to the following business day. I, I always rule of thumb use 5 p.m. on that day, just because that's close of business. Um, uh, but, uh, technically and talking to the lawyer, it actually pushes until midnight, right? The days start and end at t uh, either 1159 or 1201. What we have here in paragraph 14 E is a clarification that is an answer to one of the most frequently answered questions on the legal hotline, which is, it is a. It is, it, it, she said it was one of either two questions that they normally get. One is uh, the listing agent delivers the notice for the buyer to perform at, on day 15 of that time period, assuming that 17 is the, is the cutoff date. Um, and, and that is a, a really a little more aggressive stance, but it is a way for a listing agent to really keep that transaction on schedule. The question that they get at the car legal is, can they do that, right? We're only on day 15. How, how can they send us this document already? Um, 
and and that's what we're talking about here. Uh, yes, they can send that document on day 15 or whatever, two days prior, and they can also send that document on a weekend. The deadline cannot actually fall on the weekend, <clears throat> right? The buyer can't be made to perform on the weekend or holiday. They can only be made to perform on the next business day. So what we talked about up above um, on the timelines that we had talked about before, all those timelines stay the same. The language that's been added to this contract is only for clarification purposes and to sort of cut down on the number of calls that they get um, there at the legal hotline. Uh, and I, oh, I didn't expand this page out in a little bit more. Does that make sense, Kate? Did I, did I explain that well? We had a little pre-conference call today and I wanna make sure that I touched on what we talked on. I'm going to say yes, because you and I have discussed this, but to reiterate, if your date of performance falls on a Saturday, you can deliver the notice to perform two days prior to that Saturday, but the recipient still does not have to perform until the next uh, actual business day. Well said, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, any questions? We've got enough. We got some people who were not necessarily here. Um, any any questions about this paragraph fourteen e before we move on? And I'm assume quiet means no. Fourteen f remove the effect of removal of contingency if the buyer removes their contingency or cancellation rights unless otherwise agreed the buyer conclusively deemed to have completed their investigations and review of reports or other applicable information and disclosures pertaining to contingency or cancellation right right they've finished whatever they want to look into um, or they've elected to proceed with the transaction or they've assumed liability and expense or non delivery of any other reports. Right. Uh, and, and this is where this is an interesting thing that I've learned that I'm licensed in other states. So in Nevada, if the seller doesn't provide their disclosures, they can go all the way up until the day of close, the day before close. If the buyer signs them and moves forward with those disclosures, perfectly fine. The buyer's taken that on. The seller doesn't, there's no sort of deadline or demand or anything that they can do. California is essentially the same other than um, they don't have to release their contingencies until the seller provides those documents, the seller disclosures, and they have five days to review them. Um, if the buyer releases their contingencies, the assumption is within the contract, very clearly written, that they're accepting it, they're, they're essentially taking it as it is. Now we know in some areas of California, they, it is the normal practice for the seller, listing broker to facilitate, uh, to provide inspections, home pests, roof, fireplace, or uh, fireplace flue, chimney, whatever. Um, any inspections that would be normal customary that would be expected if you've got a sewer lateral that needs to be done and then all of the NHD is provided in advance, all the seller disclosures are, are handwritten and signed and ready to go. And the buyer has ample opportunity to review those prior to submitting an offer. In a case like that, it is very common. I won't say normal and customary because that they don't legally, we don't like that language necessarily, but it is very common for the buyers to write their offers then to remove all contingencies. Now, in the area where we practice here on the Central Coast, Paso Robles to Lompoc, Santa Barbara, it's not common for the sellers to pay for all those reports up front. And it's really not a good idea for the agents to pay for those up front. And so to expect, even in a multiple offer situation, for a buyer to come in having not seen any of the reports and possibly even not even the disclosures, it's, it's uh, unreasonable to expect a buyer to come in and release all their contingencies just to have a stronger offer. And Kate, I want you to kind of weigh in on this too. It's a bad idea, I think. It's a bad idea for you as a buyer's agent or even as a listing agent to encourage a buyer to release their or demand the, the buyer to release their contingencies prior to having an opportunity to investigate. Um, what's your take on that, Kate? I absolutely, absolutely agree. Uh, the whole system is set up to uh, keep intact 
safety hatches for your buyer. So they need to know everything that's knowable about that property before you release anything. As once those contingencies are released, they're 100% obligated to complete the transaction. Yes, or give up their deposit. Yeah. They're not, so if something changes in their situation and they've already released their contingencies, all they're giving up is their deposit, but, uh, and, and that's, and the deal dies, right? So the agents are kind of freaked out because they're not going to get paid. But if the buyer's willing to walk from their deposit um, because they've uh, abandoned the deal for some reason, once they've released their contingency, that's on them. That's fine. Uh, the effect of the cancellation deposit, the release of funds requires mutually signed, I love this, this little paragraph here. So if you've ever filled out a um, cancellation of contract form, you'll notice, you'll know that it's a two-part form. In fact, we do have plans to go over that in one of these calls. So maybe you'll see it on the YouTube channel in the future. But um, the two-part form, one is the cancellation, uh, whoever's doing the canceling, either the seller's canceling because the buyer didn't do one of the two things that they're or one of the things that they're supposed to do. There's only two things on the contract that the seller can cancel for. The other would be that the buyer has chosen to cancel and it just references the paragraph by which the buyer is canceling based in the paragraph. The, um, the bottom portion is the acknowledgement of the alternate party to release the deposit. So the seller doesn't have to sign. So if the buyer is doing the canceling on the top of that form, the buyer is the one who signs, I'm canceling and this is why. So it doesn't have to sign that top part. The bottom portion, the release of deposit, um, needs to be signed by the seller because they're the one releasing. And we generally have the buyer sign that as well. But as I understand it, Kate, it's just the, the releasing party to sign that one. Is that correct? Uh, I have required signatures on both parts. I do the same just to be safe because we're talking about all the money. Yeah. Um, but I went through that the other day. I was reading and I thought, you know what? This is this could fly through. If the buyer is saying, I want the money, the seller can say, yes, I'll give it to them. The issue comes if the, the buyer says I'm canceling, but the seller won't release it. Escrow won't release the money. And then it goes through a whole process of seven days and then 30 days and, and non-claim. And, and then it would get kicked out depending on how much money it is. Um, and, we, and we generally uh, end up in small claims court in those situations. Correct. Small claims cutoff is still 10,000, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, here also, a party may be subject to a civil penalty, penalty of up to $1,000 for refusal to sign a cancellation instruction if no good faith dispute exists. So if the seller is just being cranky about it. They just don't want to, you know, they don't like that this buyer has the option to back out on this deal, right? They feel maybe they're being dishonest or whatever. And they just say, I'm not going to sign it. They don't get their deposit. Um, they have a potential penalty for $1,000, <laughs> up to $1,000. Um, neither agents nor escrow holder are qualified to provide any opinion whether either party has acted in good faith or not, uh, or which party is entitled to the deposited funds. So be cautious when you get to, if you're representing a buyer, and that's mainly our conversation today. If you are saying, oh, well, we're backing out. So you get your deposit no matter what. Um, watch your language um, and, and check with your broker before you make any big promises like that. Um, any questions? Paragraph 14, we covered a ton of information. Any other, anything, Kate, you think we missed? Or if Tiffany, if you think we missed any of those, it's a biggie. So shall um, we restate that the contingencies are your buyer's protection and yes. once they are removed it is because the buyer has satisfied himself uh on everything and you, I, it's so important to have that conversation and they need to know if we remove these contingencies you're 100 percent in and if something happens and this blows up your uh, earnest money deposit is at risk yeah, um, I actually like to have an email. I mean, I know that everybody loves the text, um, but, and you could potentially say that you text it back and forth. And if you get an app that'll pull all your text out and make them available, but it's just so much cleaner to send an email that says, please see the attached documents, please review and authorize before we send them via DocuSign. DocuSign is very, or e-ink or zip ink or whatever. All those sign, digital signing methods are all very convenient. 
Um, but there's a step that gets missed there uh, from a professionality standpoint, uh, the part of the agent to do an actual review. Um, God forbid the agent didn't even actually read the NHD, didn't actually go through the preliminary title report and didn't review the uh, disclosures. That's just a big, big no-no. If you are a true fiduciary, you need to review those documents and actually maybe bring something up to the buyer if there's something of concern, right? Um, that just needs to be part of your buyer procedure. We're not just here to collect the paycheck. I got to actually do something to get it. So um, it's a good idea for you to bring those things to their attention, but you need to send an email to the buyer, make sure that they email back and say, yes, I approve of that. If you have two husband and wife or you have partners, life partners or business partners, either way, um, good idea to have everybody CC on that and get everyone to sign off before in email before they actually sign in DocuSign. One thing I just realized we missed was the demand to close escrow in 14G. I just skipped right over that and I apologize. There really isn't any changes to this, but I do want to make sure that we, this is serious, serious business when you're getting down to it to demand to close escrow. When I was a broker over at the franchise or both of them, um, it came, I, we closed like over 900 transactions a year. And this came up about twice a year. So it's very uncommon that we end up having to get a demand to close escrow. But if you're within three days of the close date and you're, this is what you want. This is essentially a, a notice to perform like we talked about up above in paragraph um, 14D and E, but this is a demand to close. And it's a, it's a hard stop and the dates are very specific. The timeline is very specific. Um, and it's a three day time clock on that rather than two days. If you're in a position where you think you need to submit a DCE, I would highly encourage you to loop your broker in if they're not already looped in um, or your broker support person or whoever to make sure that you get those days correct. We had a, a real expensive uh, situation where an agent had to cough up some commissions and actually the broker cough, brokerage coughed up some commissions as well um, because they didn't follow the timeline exactly correctly. So uh, no changes on this contract compared to the previous one really that I could find in the demand to close, but a little, a little star for you to lock away in your brain. Like, Hey, we're within three days of closing escrow. It looks like the buyer's getting funny about it. We need to do a notice to reform, pull that out of your brain and remember that you got to go to a notice, a, a demand to close the DCE on that one. Um, repairs. The California contract uh, in paragraph 15 now is California contract is an as is contract. And I think we've referenced that in the previous paragraphs. They do have an option. They being the buyer has an option to request that the seller have something repaired. Or if you look at the repair request, they can either repair it, replace it, um, or provide uh, uh, money or credit in lieu of that. Um, and I won't get into you know, any recommendations on how that needs to be done, but we'll just stick to the contract. Repairs need to be completed prior to final verification. If you remember, that's up to five days prior to close, unless they otherwise agree to it. Repairs need to be performed at the seller's expense or repairs that are to be performed at the seller's expense may be performed by the seller. And this is a key Thing. So when you're filling out your, oh, I hate how I can't highlight specific lines in this thing. Uh, the seller has the option, unless in the repair request or unless in whatever method that the buyer's agent uses to notify the seller that they need to perform to this, uh, the, you know, Pop Pop can be out there trying to replace the GFCI in the garage or whatever they're trying to do, uh, unless you clarify otherwise. So it's always a good recommendation. Of course, check with your broker. To, to make sure you've added in some language that all repairs need to be completed by a licensed contractor or handyman. Now, I don't know if California, Kate, maybe you can help me with this. It's never been clear to me. Is there a handyman license in California or is it, if they have a license on there, it's some other contractor license? Uh, there is an actual uh, handyman. I don't know if it's a cert or a license. Okay. All right. So I guess you could add in certified or, or licensed contractor or handyman. 
Otherwise, the seller could potentially get out there and do it themselves. And, you know, uh, our general rule of thumb when we're getting repairs done is if it can catch it on fire, if it can flood it, uh, we want to make sure it's being done by a contractor. Why? Well, uh, in the event that the repairs don't get done correctly and there's some something that happens in the future as a result of that attempted repair, the buyer only recourse would be to go back to the seller and try and squeeze some money out of them. If a licensed contractor is used, then they, the buyer could then go to the licensing board and licensed contractors have to have, be bonded and insured and uh, have an obligation to uh, get the warranty essentially their work. And the buyer could actually get things completed and done the way that it needed to be. And the seller can be happy off on their way. So it's actually a protection for the seller. They'll grumble about it because they have to pay a little more because the license um, contractor is going to cost more than just, you know, Joe from down the street helping you out. Um, but uh, as a buyer's agent, again, the pro move is to make sure that you have language stating that all repairs need to be completed by somebody licensed or certified recommendation on that final can verification spend, oh go ahead uh, Kate. Uh, can we spend a minute here yeah uh, let's stop uh, whatever method the repairs are made uh seller has the obligation to produce the mm -hmm. receipts or the invoices mm -hmm. and you want to have those to the buyer's agent before they go do their final walkthrough and um uh you if you are buyer side and uh the listing agent hasn't produced them you want to be sure to follow up. And when you go out to do your final walkthrough, take your um, agreed upon repair request oh, yeah. along with those invoices. So you are very, very clear on what got done and how it got done. Yep. A lot of times too, when they're doing, and we're, we're jumping to final verification. So these two are kind of holding hands together, 15 and 16. <clears throat> You get out to verif final verification and all that crap that was in the garage is loaded into a truck or in a storage unit and it's gone. And so you now have access to see more stuff than you could see before. Buyers are going to want to note everything, right? There's a ding and there's a hole in the drywall in the garage or there's a, a new drip somewhere. Uh, that verification and property condition allows them to do that. That's just an opportunity for the buyer to note things. It's not an obligation for the seller to repair them unless the seller had previously agreed to fix it or do some sort of repair before. Um, it's a, it's really important to note. And I don't, I didn't prepare well enough to have a copy of that verification of property condition, but it's essentially just an empty page and, and the buyer needs to write on there, the items that they feel were not repaired or were not in the same condition that they were in when they originally started the escrow. Now this includes like, uh, plants, uh, lawn trim, uh, like if they stop mowing the lawn or stop watering the lawn, they just let the bushes grow, right? Some of these escrows can be 45, 60 days long, depending on uh, the, you know, the property where it's at and the buyer's opportunity to get financing. So, you know, you, you let in the springtime, if you let these bushes grow, <laughs> you let the plants go crazy, they will. And um, we've had verification of property condition where the buyer noted, like, I can't walk on the sidewalk to get into the backyard because these bushes are out of control. And the listing agent, in the end, the listing agent sent somebody out to trim those back so we could walk. Because when they originally visited the property, of course, it was gorgeous and everything was blooming and there was an easy path in between. But 45 days later, things had kind of let go. Um, verification of property condition is also an opportunity for uh, that, uh, the personal items of the seller to be noted. Um, I've had situations where there was a, a dryer that got, was in the backyard. They tried to hide a dryer uh, against the back fence behind a tree. And so <laughs> we put that on there and, and that disappeared as well. Uh, there were some other personal items that got left behind in various transactions of some crazy stuff, but um, that the obligation is for the seller to remove their personal items. And so those, if any of those get left behind, then the buyer doesn't want to get rid of them. Old fridges, freezers, just, you know, ski equipment, whatever. Um, all that stuff needs to be gone. That verification of property condition gives you an opportunity if, if they've already vacated to, uh, to get that done. The, and, and to note in here too, that the verification of property condition is not a contingency of the sale. 
the way this all works out is that you'll use the buyer's agent are going to use that verification of property condition to go to the listing agent and say seller needs to remedy these things we're going to delay the close of escrow until this gets done now there's only so much time that you could actually do that kate you can back me up on this you can probably slow it down for a couple of days broker to broker and the broker will phone the listing broker and say, hey, you got to fix this. Send, send somebody in and get this done. I don't care if you got to open your own wallet. Let's get this done so these buyers can move forward. If, if everybody stonewalls and it doesn't actually happen, then the buyer is going to follow through, close the escrow, and then that verification of property condition is a stamp in time of the condition of the property. The buyer needs to then go spend whatever money they got to spend to remedy the situation. And then they can take that verification and their receipts and take the seller to small claims court with a copy of the contract where the seller agreed to take care of that item, repair it, replace it, or keep it in the same maintained condition. And then it'll, they'll fight it out in small claims. I guess there's a possibility, Kate, of the, the total becoming more than $10,000, but it's probably not likely. I have uh, not had it to personally go beyond that. Um, and I have only used the threat of uh, delaying close when I had a really recalcitrant seller. Mm -hmm. And that delay on the close was um, significant enough to him that, that he did comply. So it, it is, you know, use that one wisely and judiciously. Yep. And that's, one more thing, and 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 I'm I will tell you that I work for a brokerage, and the broker is out of town, so I'm I'm in the boat with this. But this is one of those situations where having a, a local broker who knows the other local brokers this in this particular instance, if the seller is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, it sure is nice to be able to, as a broker, call up another one and go, "Can we just get this fixed?" You know, yeah. me calling my broker in San Diego is. And, and having her kind of try and strong arm some one of the local uh, brokers here is probably not going to go as well mm -hmm. as as me as a broker calling up Kate saying, hey, can you help your agent? We need you to get this done. This is the, these three things are all that need to happen. Let's get it done. Um, there is an advantage to that, I will say. There sure is. Okay. So not that it's a good old boys network because it's certainly not anymore um, as much as it was, but it is those relationships between brokers, you know, we have some really seasoned veterans that are doing this business for 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. And um, th there's a lot of these problems that can be solved without too much hassle, without too much yelling and stomping of feet. And uh, it's just, it's just really nice as a broker. I've, I can't tell you how how nice it was to just pick up the phone and call up, call up somebody over there, see, hey, can you know ask her if we can get this fixed, and we do, and it's done. Um, any any other touches on uh, verification of property condition, Kate? I think you did a really good, comprehensive job of um, of covering that. Yeah, that's that's a confusing point for a lot of buyers agents and a lot, well, actually some listing agents as well, right? You'll have sellers that will stonewall and say, I'm not going to sign it because I'm not going to obligate myself to fix it. That's not what this is about. Just to go back to that. It's just a buyer's opportunity to say, this is what I'm noting. And I could come after you later, maybe <laughs> if I incur costs as a result, but um, pro rata, prorations of property taxes and other items. You'll remember from when you got your license that pro rata is basically saying uh, by day by day, right? A per diem is, uh, is, is a fee and pro rata is a return of um, a tax or a fee that has already been paid. So uh, property taxes weren't just noting in the contract. Again, Kate, I don't think, do you know of any changes from the other contract that we had? I guess I can jump over there and see, but. Uh, that line in bold, tax bills and utility bills issued after the close of escrow yep. shall be handled directly between buyer and seller. Yeah. That's, that is noteworthy, and I believe it's new, um, because that kind of stuff does, uh, it does show up. Yeah, so um, taxes are due, of course, on the, or the, what's the rule of thumb, no darn fooling around? It's November, December, February, and April. Um, they're due on one month and late on the next, but um, the taxes will be done on a pro rata basis. And 
escrow wants to stay out of this, right? They're just going to take the taxes that are that have already been paid based on the current tax rate. What will end up happening, especially if the property being sold has been owned for, I don't know, what would you say, Kate, 10, 10 or more years? Uh, the tax rates that they're being charged are different than the incoming taxes. And so the new buyer will get a supplementary tax bill and it'll ruffle their feathers potentially because they're getting this extra bill and they want somebody to go pay it. So um, the, that's part of what we're talking about in this uh, is this because the pro rata, the buyer will prepay and pick up where the seller left off. The seller gets a refund on, on anything from that day moving forward to the next due date. And uh, the buyer, as you can imagine, would would see that when they go back in and look at the settlement statement, they'll be like, hey, I had to prepay this and they got money back and now I have this bill. I need that money from them so I can pay it. Um, that it's, it is a good note to say that, again, tax and utility bills issued after close would be handled directly between the buyer and seller. They got a problem, they got to slug it out themselves. Uh, surprisingly, I've had this happen with, recently. Um, with propane tanks, these big propane tanks that are on the rural properties. And maybe that's just where we are in the market right now. I'm selling a lot of these rural properties, but the, there's a, you know, four or five, $600 worth of propane in these big tanks. And unless somebody brings it up and we determine how it's going to be broken out, um, the propane company is left to kind of shrug because, you know, we take ownership on the first of the month and the next visit of the propane guy is the 20th, unless the propane company knows that we've closed on the first and they come out and make a, a note where we are in the tank, they're not gonna know how much to credit back to the seller once that next bill gets logged in and paid. And I mean, I'm not paying anybody's propane bill for them, but it's come up twice in like the last few months and I've, I'm surprised at it, but um, that's another pro rata that could be considered a utility bill. Um, I don't think we're going to have a lot of questions on that, but if there is, give me a holler. And otherwise, we're going to move. We're going to move a little more quickly through these next couple paragraphs. Um, any questions on that prorision of taxes and other items? No, but would you mind if we just skip back uh, to restate uh, the situation with the SWPI, where we uh, we got the awareness that almost mm. every detail. Um, of the contract is handled on that big grid on the first three pages uh -huh. for the SWPI. And what, what you said about the uh, propane tank is uh, what triggered this thought for me, because that is, is that, where the arrangement should be made about the propane tank and how much uh, fuel is left in it. Let's see, where am I? Keep um, going, keep going, keep going. We're, included, excluded, smoke alarms, government, point of sale, HOA, home one key. Keep going. Okay, here we are. Uh, hang on, right there. Um, the You'll see in paragraph 4B, the okay. SDBPI, it shows up there, but that is not in, in the grid part. Ah, um, okay. That's a good so, point. Yep. And you know, new agents that don't know about well septic and propane and all that kind of thing yeah, uh, yeah. it feels like that would be very very easy to overlook yeah if you're new to any particular transaction right if all you've sold is condos and you jump into trying to sell a mobile home for example or if you're in that price range or if you all you've sold is regular neighborhood homes and you're jumping into your first luxury home or your first ranch property always a good idea to loop your broker in or if you've got a mentor that's assigned to you at your brokerage um, or if you're paying for coaching from me loop me in too um, and we can help walk you through that but that's one of those things that just will slip by and you think you're doing a great little job at, you know being a good soldier and taking it on yourself if you miss that you know where they're going to look if the mistake is made on the part of the agent um, they're coming to you for that you know, what's left of the propane tank or, you know, whatever else. Um, Cause that truly is a mistake that you made that you should have known had you done your job and looped in your broker. That makes sense, Kate? Yes, it does. We just had one yeah. of those unfortunate situations go through yeah. here, rural property, new agent, didn't know about an SWPI. 
So he got to be yeah, land land too is another one of those or you get these guys that want to you know start a cannabis farm and you're jumping in trying to be a helper you they go this is going to be great i'm going to sell cannabis properties so you know i'll be a specialist uh, it is super complicated um you know the i love these agents that jump in and try to do vineyards and wineries and because they want to get into and maybe that is a true interest of theirs and maybe they will be a great expert someday but you got to loop in somebody who knows what's up um, and not get yourself into uh, in the hot water. There's a phrase that's um, don't come complaining to me when a wildfire gets away from you when you started the fire. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so uh, you got to keep those fires small if you can, so you can put them out yourself, and then loop in, bring in your firefighter to uh, to put that out when it starts getting away from you. My, one of my favorite paragraphs in this whole uh, contract is paragraph 18, because it talks about compensation, right? I always say this with a smile, but this is, you know, this is compensation will be payable. Come on, close of escrow. Or if escrow does not close, as otherwise specified in the agreement between the buyer and seller, right? Sometimes the seller can obligate themselves to pay a commission, regardless of if it closes or not. Um, scope of duty is something of a reiteration of what we already deal with at the beginning of all of this, when we go through the agency disclosure. Um, however, it, it does have provide some specific detail that is not addressed in that. And it's an acknowledgement on the part of the buyer and seller, that they acknowledge and agree that the agent does not decide what price the buyer needs to pay or the seller needs to accept, uh, doesn't guarantee condition of the property. We don't guarantee performance or adequacy of any inspection services, products, repairs, you know, we do our best. We have some connections. We can sometimes save them a few bucks, but we have no say so. I have no warranty or guarantee of anybody. And, and agents will sometimes provide three cards or, you know, whatever to try and sidestep some of this. But in the end, um, everyone has already acknowledged by signing the contract. You can feel bad that uh, a con that a inspector missed something or didn't move a cap didn't move a couch so they could see the termite damage from the pest inspector. But um, this paragraph is, is the protection for the broker and the agent uh, representing the buyer to be uh, it's, it's a sort of a catch-all protection. The AD deals with the agent's responsibility to the client. 18B talks about scope of duty. And, and we really have a fairly limited scope of duty. It's our job to handle the transactional details. We coordinate and um, administrate these details. It's not our decision. And if you're around long enough, you will have buyers say, what do you think I should do? <laughs> and it, rather than just answer, and this is especially if you're doing business with a friend, um, you would want to get back to, and part of fiduciary is understanding the overall motivation of the buyer on why they would want to buy this property. Just remind, remind them, bring them back to what's important about this property to them and ask if anything had changed. Let them come to their own decision rather than make a recommendation on what they should do. Because when you start telling them what they should do, then you're giving, you're potentially out of your scope. Any of these things in here are out of your scope of duty. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but if, you, if you're curious of what your limits and your scope is, or if you've got a, a buddy at the office, two, to, two desks down that is giving construction advice or tax or legal advice, um, you, can go, you can refer them to this and, and help them out, keep them out of trouble. Um, I'm going to move on unless there's any comments. Join escrow instructions. I really don't spend a whole lot of time on this. This is really just the instructions to your escrow officer. And it takes each of the paragraphs where a buyer or seller makes a commitment or something. Uh, and you won't really see agent commitments inside of this document, because again, the agent is just an agent. They're not a participant. They're not a principal in this transaction. No matter how connected you might be, in most cases, you are not a principal. Um, and so I just, I move fairly quickly through this. It doesn't really have much to do. We've touched on each of the paragraphs where the buyer is making or seller is making a commitment um, and it's instructions to the escrow officer. So most times the escrow officer will take these instructions and put it in a separate document and the buyer or seller will both sign 
um, the responsible portions so that the buyer essentially is going to sign twice for these same instructions as is the seller so that it just doesn't get buried in the link in the language because there is a, a tendency to want to just go okay man i am 12 pages into a 16 page uh document i'm just going to keep going i'm just going to muscle through this and uh, there's not much for us as agents to be concerned about with that escrow instructions uh, so I, I don't burn a whole lot of time on it when I'm going through it. Uh, selection of service providers. Again, we touched on that when we talked about our scope of service. Uh, we don't guarantee performance of any vendors, service product providers, um, whether referred by the agent or, or seller. We are um, uh, kept by RESPA from taking fees, kickbacks, or otherwise the Residential Escrow Settlement Procedures Act, and I should know what year, because I just went through CE on that, but I don't remember when it was put into law, um, is preclude you from accepting fees or benefiting from using a particular provider. You will note that if you're using, if the brokerage that you're working with is of a certain size and they have ancillary services that they also offer, um, there will be a, uh, oh, it's slipping my mind now. Um, basically an acknowledgement form to say this company also participates in escrow sell settlement services, property management, uh, home inspections, or whatever other services that they provide. There has to be an acknowledgement on the part of the buyer and seller that the brokerage also is connected to these other providers because of, and that ties back to RESPA, because the owner or the broker is going to benefit financially as a result if the buyer chooses to use one of those uh, services it's of those called, other companies. Escrow is the most common. What's that, Kate? It's called the Affiliated Business Advisor. There it is. Yeah. We get mush mind when I'm trying to present and run the whole thing. Yeah. Affiliated yeah business services. So there is no problem at all I, that I see of having, so for example, a, uh, and I don't think mentioning a certain brokerage, but let's say it's Century 21, right? Big brokerage, uh, good size. If they had an escrow settlement, escrow services, and they provided other services, if they have a, um, an acknowledgement of affiliated business arrangement or affiliated business uh, acknowledgement. Advisory, yep. Yeah. Right. And so, uh, and you, let's say, for example, the buyer agent works for Cobble Banker, right? So they're going to get all prickly because the Century 21 logo is on it. And they're going to say, we're not going to sign that. No, nope, it's not a problem. It's just an acknowledgement. And we're all just trying to comply with the law. So there's no reason, to, unless they're making some sort of obligation, and uh, we can get into some of these other, you know, homemade disclosures that we're starting to see more and more. Um, where they want to try and add it to the contract. It's not it's just an acknowledgement that the brokerage is uh, uh, saying we make money doing these other things. So I hope I didn't go too far down the rabbit hole on that one, but um, I, I, I just would run into this on a regular basis when I was reviewing contracts in the brokerage and we would have documents and, and disclosures that would get sent over that were created by the mothership of whatever um, company had sent it over and they just want to get it signed and, and if you look through it and if, if there's no if this if it's not obligating the buyer or seller to any particular performance it's not adding to the contract if it's truly a disclosure um i always just didn't have any problem i'm just like fine just sign it if it is just and just a disclosure um and almost invariably one of those will have a, a little paragraph above the signature line saying, I'm just acknowledging receipt of this information. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, check on that and make sure that's again, another little pro move right there for you to make sure that go through that, read it and see if there's any language that commits the buyer to, or adds that document to the contract as part of the commitment. Um, we do talk about service providers. Okay. Uh, multiple listing service. I, I don't, know of any changes that they've made with we didn't go over that in any of the training that i've been through so far um it's just an acknowledgement buyer and seller agree that uh, essentially the agents are going to report the closing price and the buyer's agent and if there's any um consolations that are given 
um, to get it closed. Attorneys fees and costs, any action preceding arbitration between the buyer and seller arising out of this agreement, uh, the prevailing buyer or seller will be entitled to reasonable attorney fees and costs. We're going to touch back on this. So the prevailing party, whether winner or the winner in a legal argument, um, as is uh, committing themselves in paragraph 22 to, to pay for the legal fees of the other party if they if their behavior forced them to to uh, take legal action. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to burn too much time on that because we're going to touch on that when we deal with dispute resolution here in about three minutes. Um, but if you want to if we need to come back to it, let me know at that time and we'll touch back on this. Assignment is one of the things that we. Uh, a lot of our newer agents, um, there's kind of a big push right now for wholesaling. That's what assigning is. If you put a car, uh, property under contract and then sell that contract for an assignment fee to another party, or if you are buying the property as an individual and then you decide you're going to bring in a partner or an LLC to partner with you in some way, you'll have buyers that will go ahead and do that. Now, this residential purchase agreement is not really designed for that. Um, but it, it is addressed. The concept of assignment is addressed. Um, again, this contract is really designed for single, single uh, or, or under four unit investment properties and primary residence, secondary residences. If you're looking at something more than that, or if it's a, uh, an income property, which is where we see the best wholesale deals, at least right now, you want to use an RIPA contract. Um, the, the idea of assignment is basically to say the name of this person, let's say Scott Taylor, I'm going to uh, put my name on the line. I'm going to offer to buy a property and we work out a deal with the seller. Um, if I had plans to assign it, I would say successor and or assigns or just and or assigns um, that would give notice to the listing agent and the seller that I, there's a possibility that I might be assigning this contract to someone else. And then that signer would be taking on the responsibility to close. I would not be able to, as an assignor, um, be able to completely sidestep my obligations in the contract. So I still have this thread of an obligation to make to close on the property. So if the if my assignee, say I signed it to Kate, Kate says, no, I want to buy this from you. I'll give you some money and it's an assignment fee and I'm going to take this contract over. Um, she takes it over, but if she can't fund it, she can't close it in the end, I still have that same obligation to make sure that gets done. So it's kind of a dangerous game to be playing. Um, what you, what you are obligating yourself, if you're using the, the forms, oh my gosh, this makes me crazy. Buyer shall disclose the seller, the name of the assignee and the amount of any monetary consideration between the buyer and assignee. So is Chelsea still on? this paragraph 23, your guys need to go through. And if you've got, we've got some other agents that are going to see this in the video um, that are going, that are coaching students. This is, this is a critical point. You need to make sure that you follow through on this, that if, if this buyer is the buyer, number one is assigning to an end buyer. If there's money exchanging hands or an assignment fee exchanging hands, there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement that the seller has agreed to, or has been at least notified that an assignment fee of five, 10, 15, 20, I don't know, sometimes hundred grand sometimes um, is being paid to the buyer and that the, this is the new buyer. Um, we actually, and Tiffany and the TCs that we work with are very well versed. If you are um, assigning a contract, there's actually an assignment form in car forms. And then the new buyer would have to go through an initial and sign next to where all the buyer initials are so that they can prove that they've had a chance to review the documents. Um, and so that's, that's a critical point that the wholesalers or the, 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 the teams that come into town and teach people how to wholesale property. If you are a, a realtor, so licensed real estate agent, you have obligations through fiduciary, through your licensing, through the state of California. If you are a realtor, you have an obligation to the association of realtors to use this contract, regardless of what purchase type you're making. 
So if you've got some sort of downloaded it from the internet contract, if you want the support of the lawyers from the Association of Realtors, and in a lot of cases, the backup of the attorneys and the E&O insurance coverage from your brokerage, you need to be using this contract. So this, you'll need to make sure you comply with that. I don't get too deep into wholesaling. Maybe we can have a separate contract discussion on that, but um, assignment is one of those things that is not <laughs> very well understood. I think it's really important if you're going to play in that game, you're going to swim in that pool that you really understand as a licensee, your obligation to do that. Uh, I have a personal belief that now I used to do a lot of wholesaling. I got my real estate license because I have a belief that to be an active wholesaler, you need to have the additional knowledge uh, of the license that goes behind it. So I don't, it's not something that I think that because you're a licensee, you shouldn't do wholesaling or you shouldn't assign, um, but make sure that you follow the contract and use the correct contract. So that's, so I'm going to hop off on my soapbox now and keep moving. <laughs> um, equal housing opportunity, of course. We're going to be aware of the 21, is it 21 still? Protected classes in the state of California. Mm -hmm. Race, creed, or sexual orientation, familial status, um, all of that. We want to make sure uh, and, and have our little ears open for if you're dealing with a seller that says, I don't want anybody, of, I don't want anybody like that. I don't want any of those people to buy my home or move into my, you know, their old neighborhood, in the neighborhood they're leaving. Um, be really, really aware of that. Be really cautious um, because that's, you know, that's federal law and that's kind of a big deal. And uh, in the environment that we're in now, the political and, and socio, sociolo sociological climate that we're in, just need to really step forward as a professional and do a good job for all parties. And that is how, equal, that's our equal housing opportunity. We don't have much, um, violations with that. I haven't come across it. I think just one time when I was the broker for those years, um, there was a, a threat of that. We did the investigation. We figured out that it was a misunderstanding based on somebody's last name. Um, the, but the buyer had the, the thought that they were being discriminated against because their last name. And uh, as it turns out, the seller who they thought was being racially biased against the buyer was of the same race and culture as the buyer. So um, that kind of neutralized that problem, but uh, just be really cautious and really aware of that. Even to the point where you wouldn't do business with somebody who um, was blatant about it. My recommendation, check with your broker on that. Now, definitions and instructions. Kate, uh, help me out on this one because I don't think there's any updates on this. Counting days seems longer, um, but I think it's just because they've added an, ex an explanation. Oh, let's see. Oh, please. I was going to switch to the old version here. Hold on. And yes, I've got the old version in front of me. And definitions. Uh, and they added counting days, brand new. Yes, okay. So this is the old version. And you'll see that counting days is not a part of it. Did I? Oh, okay, so they've moved it around. Okay, I thought I might've missed something. No, they can um, move. They, they did move this around, so. Accept, acceptance, I'll just go through them one by one, is the time the offer or final counter offer is fully executed in writing. We can get into some little fine points on that, but that is the acceptance. For the, for the counting of days, we're going to get down to his for counting of days, but for counting of days, day, the day of acceptance is day zero, and then you start counting forward from there. Agent means a broker or salesperson or broker associate of the real estate license company. Um, agreement is this document, meaning the RPA, but also associated addendums that are attached to it. So if you add that septic well, property monument um, document, or you add, uh, I don't know, other addendums of some sort, those will be part of the agreement. Now, there are um, acknowledgments that happen, right? The wire fraud advisory is not technically part of the contract, but it's part of our package. 
So if unless it's an actual addendum to the contract, then it's not necessarily part of this agreement. Um, as is, sellers shall disclose material facts, but the buyer has the right to inspect the property. This is, I think this is more clear. Wait, ah, I keep doing this. Do we have as is on here too? No. As is is new also, right, Kate? Yes. Oh, sorry guys, my... Um, my toolbar keeps floating down on top of the uh, document here. There we go. Okay, so as is condition, right? The, this is um, what? How do I how do I say this in a way that? So the the contract in the state of California. Or I've said this before. So, but I've got some new people on this week. The contract in California is very buyer friendly. It's very buyer protective. However. It is an as-is contract. It's not as firm on the buyer as some states, right? The, the cutoffs for time periods are, are can slide. Uh, we have continuation. We have protections for the buyers. Other states and other areas have contracts that are very arbitrary. Like we roll past day 17 and you've, you know, your money is now gone. Um, if you back out, that's not the way it is in California. However, I love this. And the clarification that this is an as-is contract. However, the buyer has the right to inspect the property. And then within time specified request, the seller make repairs, right? It, this is where we talk about the definition of that. I think that the as-is is touched on in another part of the contract, but I like how this is brought specifically gives us an opportunity to go, okay, based on the definition 25D, this is an as-is contract. But the buyer can still ask for repairs. Authorized agent is an individual real estate licensee specified in the broker section. So if you go back to this. That's a new addition, a new definition. Right? So authorized agent is this section. Oh, this, this clicky part makes me crazy. That buyer's agent here is what they're talking about there. Um, C-A-R form means the most current version of the specific form referenced or another compatible form agreed to by the parties. There are situations, new home construction or uh, apartment to condo conversions that I've come across where we, we may actually use an older version of the contract only because it's been pre-approved and authorized by the state of California. And just because C-A-R has updated the contract doesn't mean that that vendor or contractor needs to go back to the state, get reapproved, go through that whole process. So if you are dealing in a uh, condo conversion is the most recent one that I've seen, but new home uh, construction, if it's a smaller than, oh boy, smaller than 12 units, smaller than 15 units, they may actually get the CAR contract approved. And if it was approved a year ago, they're going to use the older version of this contract and not the newer one. For our basic day-to-day -day operations, once we reach, at this point, I think it's December 14th, we'll see, right? If they're gonna make us follow through on that. But um, uh, at this point, the after the 14th, we're no longer gonna be using this older version of the contract, we would use the, the new version, right? The king is dead, long live the king. Uh, that's kind of what we're dealing with, but on a contractual situation. Uh, close of escrow, we know what that means. We love COE. Uh, copy means copy, including photocopy, facsimile, and electronic. Now, um, electronic is defined to be PDF version of a document. If you take a picture and send that picture to your buyer and have them somehow sort of authorize it or approve it, a, a photo can be doctored up and mess with more easily than a PDF. So we always want to lean to PDF. I had a, a buyer text me a picture of a computer screen showing that he had uh, secured evidence of insurance for this closing that's going to happen later this week. I said, can you please have your insurance agent send that to me in a PDF? That's what we're talking about. We want to make sure that when we're um, verifying documents um, or providing a copy of a document that we're using a PDF to do that. Counting days. The easiest way that I've come up with to describe this is, again, acceptance of the, or the day that any document is signed and delivered 
is considered day zero. And then you begin counting the key one being acceptance date, um, acceptance of the contract. So back and forth, counter, 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 we get acceptance that it begins day zero and the counting begins one, two, three, four. If you get everything signed and done on a Saturday then and, and delivered, then Sunday is day one. Just because you deliver the documents to escrow and they got it on Monday or Tuesday, if it was a holiday, they're going to want to say, okay, we got it. This is, this is day one for us. Check your dates, make sure your transaction coordinator is on top of it because that has a big influence on when you close and when your cutoff time periods are the the counting of days is a big deal in what we deal with here um we touched already when we started off the call today on um this topic the counting days and and how that works out kate do you think we touched on that adequately or do we need to dig into this a little more i'm starting yes. to run out of time yeah, I feel that we did a really good job first go okay. around. So if you do have questions, either put them in the comments on the YouTube channel, if you're watching this later, or hit me up and uh, we can make sure or, or talk to your, you know, your broker or, or whoever helps you out with this kind of stuff. But and the, the biggie is that day zero, one, two, three, four, five from there. Uh, and we always count calendar days and then watch when that calendar, where that calendar day falls knowing that the date of performance may actually be further down the road, um, depending on each scenario on holidays and weekends. Uh, day means a calendar day. Uh, deliver, and then it goes through some definitions of how we can deliver uh, documents. And uh, we use this RFR for receipt for reports. Um, electronic copy or electronic signature as long as it complies with California law, um, buyer and seller are agreeing by signing this document that uh, electronic means will not be used by either party to modify or alter the content or integrity of this agreement without the knowledge or consent of the other party, which is why we'll have initials next to changes that are made on, one, on if it was made through DocuSign or whether the other e-signature methods. Law means any law, uh, statute, code, conveyance, or other controlling city, county, or state. And we'd talk about which, if you're filing, um, if you're anticipating legal action, you're going to talk about the county, that it'll be the jurisdiction, the primary jurisdiction. Legally authorized signer is an individual authorized to sign, and that depends on whether they're buying as an individual or an entity, and that's a separate conversation that we have had and will continue to have. Um, repairs is uh, any repairs, including pests or alterations retrofitted to the property provided under this agreement. Signed means signed by hand or by electronic. Um, I think terms and conditions is also new. Yes, it is. It is, yes. So um, this is an offer to purchase property on the terms and conditions herein. The individual liquidated damages and arbitration disputes paragraphs are incorporated in this agreement if initialed by all parties or if incorporated by mutual agreement in a counteroffer addendum. If at least one, this is very key here, guys. Um, and this, is the, this was understood but not brought out in bold type. Uh, always follow, pay attention to that bold type. If at least one but not all parties initial, a counteroffer is required until an agreement is reached. So when we're dealing with this, now, I don't know, does that include liquidated damages, Kate, or are we just talking about arbitration disputes? Nope, it includes everything. We have to have an exact match to demonstrate a meeting of the minds. So if, and, and where it most often comes into play is here, dealing with uh, dispute resolution, which, God, I wanted to touch on that today. Um, arbitration disputes is the biggie, and we'll get into that in a bit on why. But if, you know, buyer one initials and buyer two does not, and the sellers do, then you, you don't have a, a complete meeting of the minds. You need to either have buyer two come back and reinitial this um, or add it, or, and, and actually the way that it ends up working is that they, um, agree in a counter offer to come back and, and initial and say it is a part of the contract or it's not a part of the contract 
Um, it's either all or nothing on that one because later on, and again, we'll touch on this, that the only, the best time for people to come to an agreement is when the deal is being struck. It's really challenging once the deal has been struck and done and um, to come back and try and add something in big like that, especially with dispute resolution. Um, <laughs> By signing this offer or any document in a transaction, the party signing the document is deemed to have read the document and is in its entirety. Time is of the essence is not new. That was the old paragraph 29. Neither this agreement nor any provision. Let's see, is that the same language? Neither this agreement nor any provision in it may be extended, amended, modified, or altered except in writing signed by buyer and seller. Legally authorized signer. Now we touched on that up above here on 25N. Um, nothing new here. And we will talk about legal capacity, capacity to sign, um, and how that's done correctly. Kate, we're going to use your document again someday. Oh, good. Scott, it's 2.30, yes, and I yeah. truly do feel that uh, the last two pages of this document uh, have significant changes that really Big should deal. be studied. So would you consider adjourning and focusing yeah. on, on those uh, and giving them the attention they need? Absolutely. Um, I'll post the first this one and the first three sessions that we did, and then we'll come back and we'll do a session five. It's going to be a nice long, um, maybe the people will put it on one and a half speed or skip from, from unit to unit, but I think it's important. Liquidated damages is a confusing concept um, at times. And then the whole dispute resolution, as you know, I have a whole 20 minute uh, talk on dispute resolution and, and how best to have that discussion with the buyer. So let's touch on that next week. Next week is actually the first Tuesday of December. So let's hit on it. And then we're supposed to start using this contract on the 14th. So we have plenty of time. If everybody's cool with that, let's do it. Way cool with that. Thank you. Okay, so to wrap up today, uh, if you have, again, if you have any comments or questions, you can either reach out to me directly or put comments in the YouTube uh, comments below. We'll have those turned on unless it gets ugly. We get, we get some haters in there. Maybe we'll turn that off. But, um, but I appreciate you being here and I appreciate your input. Kate, as always, thank you very much. Um, and if you have uh, any need for contract help or real estate agent and broker support coaching, uh, go ahead and head over to my website, scotttaylorprivatecoaching.com and sign up. It's very reasonable. And you get one-on-one -on -one attention with me up to an hour a month talking about whatever you want to, to build your career. Appreciate it. Thanks guys for being here. And until next week, we'll see you later. Thanks, Scott. Okay, guys. We'll see you next week.